just sounds expensive. Lately, one of the most common requests that Hannah and I get in our comments is for a review of portable burners, and we understand why. Having an extra burner can really come in handy. Our team has previously tested portable induction burners, and just recently we tested gas and electric burners, which tend to be less expensive and offer some different advantages. Hannah and I are going to show you our winning gas, electric, and induction burners, so you can decide which option is right for you. First up, Lisa with gas and electric. Okay, so let's first talk about electric burners. This is our winner by Yamusa, and it is very tiny, as you can see. It's very lightweight, it's very portable, very inexpensive. But it was more powerful than other electric burners that we tested, and honestly, just did a better job. We had two others in the testing that were very sleek and futuristic looking, but they were terrible, mainly because they have safety cutoff switches, so I could not boil water on them. I waited up to an hour and no water would boil. They would get up into the 200 degree range and then they would cut off for safety and then start climbing again. So this one actually boiled water and it was great at searing burgers. I was able to cook in a wok in it. They're not super powerful, but they're great for ordinary cooking, low temperatures. When I made fondue in these to hold it at a low temperature, this was able to hold a low temperature and keep that fondue nice and bubbly and not broken and not too cold. So it's nice for when you want to hold something at a low temperature. Very adjustable, very simple, on, off, low, medium, high right there and that's all you need to know. It's got some limitations in that you cannot use a large pan on it. Anything that's 10 pounds or over is not safe to use on this burner because it is kind of small and that includes a stock pot full of liquid or a Dutch oven. So we couldn't do any deep frying or any cooking of big pots of things. You do need electricity. This is not great for a power outage, but for any other situation where you just need another burner, it's a great choice and very inexpensive. They make this cord very short and that's on purpose because they don't want a big dangling cord and someone could walk by and whip this onto the floor when it's hot. If you use an extension cord with it, make sure it's a well-grounded, heavy-duty extension cord and make sure it's out of the way of anybody walking by. Obviously, when you're cooking, you make a lot of mess. This is great because it is so small that anything that splatters out of the pan does not get on here, but if you need to wipe it off, it's pretty easy to just wipe down the surface of this and keep it clean. One thing I will say about this is when you're cooking in those other ones that have really smooth tops, it seems really cool except when you're stirring the pot is scooting around and that's not safe. This, the pot stayed where it was put so we really kind of did prefer this very old school style. Okay, so let's talk about portable gas burners. This is our favorite, it's by Grill Boss and all of them have similar profiles. So the, the burner is here this little sidecar for the butane canister, the fuel, and then this is the adjustment knob and you just adjust the flame just as you would on a gas burner at home. They all have automatic ignition so you don't need a match, they will light themselves. And um, they're really handy, they're great because they do not require any power other than the fuel canister. So if you have a power outage situation and you need to be able to cook, these are great for that. If you're outdoors camping um, in an RV or whatever, they're also wonderful for that. If you love to do deep frying, but you don't want to mess up your kitchen, you can put this out back and do any kind of splattery, hot, steamy thing out there with this burner and not have to mess up your kitchen. Because they're nice and powerful, you can do lots of stir frying. I love to use mine with my wok. It's nice and secure. These little things hold the pot in place and um, you can really do any kind of cooking in this because the power is very strong. One thing that isn't great in these is when we were trying to hold fondue for a couple of hours after making it. I made the fondue fine on here, but when I turned it way down, some of the gas burners went out and they didn't hold the low flame. And some of them couldn't go low enough. So we had broken, greasy, yucky fondue, or you know they went out and we didn't notice and the gas was still flowing. So don't ever leave them unattended and don't put them on really low flame and expect them to hold that for a long time. And that's an area where an induction or electric burner has a leg up. You can hold a low temperature more effectively and a little more safely. And then as we've all been thinking a lot about how gas burners might emit some fumes, um, 
you don't want to use these indoors unless it's very well ventilated. Open some windows, get some powerful fans going, but you want to make sure there's some good air flow if you're using these indoors. All of the gas burners that we tested use butane. This one and another one we tested are dual fuel burners, and that means they can also use propane, which gives you another option. And there's a few good reasons that we chose a dual fuel burner. I'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's just talk about how we get this set up. Take the cap off the butane, save that. You want that for storage in between uses. Open the little sidecar. So there's a little notch, and that is where you want to line this up with the top of the fuel chamber. You just drop it in place, and then this locks it. So that makes it pull forward and snugly fit into the igniter. And then you turn it on. And then you back it off to where you want it. And this one, unlike some of the others, was pretty good at maintaining a low flame. That is the butane. To take it out, you just reverse the process. You unlock the canister, lift it out, and put that cap back on. And always store these in a cool, dry place, away from the flame. Never store it in the burner because it is engaged and it is open when this lock is on. And when it's not, it's loose. Let's talk about propane and how to hook that up. This model has a beautiful long, well, comparatively long hose for hooking up the propane. And that is nice. Some of the other models, here's one from another model, this little stick. Um, that kept the tank pretty close to the burner. This lets you put it away from the burner, which is kind of reassuring. So you're gonna hook this end up to the stove. So it just screws into place right here. This end just goes onto the tank. Propane hooks right up to the same spot. When you've got butane in here, pans that overhang the butane can trap some of the heat next to that canister, and that can be dangerous. It can actually cause this canister to explode if it gets too hot. So you don't want to use a big frying pan that's going to overlap this side chamber. If you're going to use a larger pan, you want to hook it up to propane, and the propane tank can be farther away, so you're perfectly safe to use a large pan. Again, with the propane or the butane, never leave it hooked up like this if you're not using it. Unhook it fully, recap it, and store it in a cool, dark place. Um, and that will be much safer and will keep your burner in good condition. Important safety tip, when you're done using your propane canister, you want to detach the canister first. Earlier, I wasn't thinking, I did the wrong end, and this is what happened. Oh shoot, that was stupid. <laughs> Don't show that. Okay, so here we go. We're detaching the canister first. And just like with butane, you want to store this, you want to cap it and store it in a cool, dry place out of sunlight. The other thing that's really great about these is when you're cooking, these little prongs really hold the cookware in place. There's no slipping. It's anything you put on here feels very secure. So when I was stir frying, it didn't feel like the wok was going to go flying off. When I was doing deep frying, the big pot of oil felt very secure. This is a kind of a grippy finish. It's got these little ridges. It really holds the pot in place and you feel very safe. For cleanup time, this is a great thing. The whole top comes off. You can put this right in the sink. You can scrub it hot soapy water, anything. It's just this whole top piece is cleanable. And nothing really gets down here, but you can wipe it up and you can wipe this off. So it's very easy to take care of. With one of the gas burners I tested, the top did not come off. And that was awful. Food and all little schmutz and crumbs got into the top and you couldn't get them out. And along the same notion, all of the gas burners come with this little plastic suitcase. You definitely want to store this and all its parts in here because you don't want any dust or or greasy residue to attract anything that's gonna get those gas passageways clogged up in any way. You wanna keep it clean, dry, dust-free, and store it right in here. But do not store it with the canister in it. Keep that separate. Finally, power is kind of important. We had gas burners that range from 7,500 BTUs up to 15,000. This one is 12,000 BTUs, and that's comparable to a powerful gas burner on your stove. These had plenty of power to put a good browned crust on a burger or to stir fry or to keep oil hot for deep frying, and that was really important. These are nice, powerful devices. They're great for cooking. 
Induction cooking uses magnetism to generate heat and cook your food. They're also purportedly safer because they often offer extra features like automatic shut off and screen locking mechanisms. They're also easier to clean and more efficient than gas or electric. An induction burner contains an electric coil that produces a magnetic field. When a pan with a ferromagnetic bottom is placed on the burner, the energy from the magnetic field causes the pan to produce heat. These burners will not turn on unless there's an induction compatible pan on top. An easy way to tell if your pan will work on an induction burner is a quick magnet test. I have our winning stainless steel skillet here from All Clad and a magnet. This pan definitely will work on an induction burner. Since only the metal of the pan heats up, all of that energy goes directly into the cookware, unlike with gas or electric stoves where a lot of it dissipates into the air. There's a cool trick you can do to really illustrate how little energy dissipates from the burner. You can slip a $20 bill on the burner while you're boiling water and that $20 bill will be totally fine. I've got our best buy here from Duck's Top. This model features an intuitive and responsive control panel that made it easy to adjust the time and temperature for various cooking tasks. It was able to boil water in 24 minutes and on the low end of the scale, it was able to keep cheese fondue at a nice consistent low temperature for four hours without scorching. However, this burner did have some limitations. When we used a 12 inch skillet to sear burgers, they cooked unevenly. It also struggled in the deep frying test, taking 20 minutes to come back up to temperature after we added a batch of zucchini, which definitely slowed us down a little bit. Despite how big these burners look, they can typically only cook their best with smaller cookware because the heat is really concentrated in the center of the pan. This comes down to cost. These coils are expensive and they make the machine quite a bit bigger. Here are a couple tips to overcome the limitations that most induction burners have because of that smaller six inch coil. Be sure to preheat the pan with some oil in it for a couple minutes longer to allow for a little bit of extra time for that heat to spread out from the center. Use a heavy duty heat retaining skillet such as cast iron or a tri-ply stainless steel and aluminum model like our winner here from Allclad. Also, Go smaller, use a 10 inch skillet instead of a 12 inch skillet because if you better match the size of your skillet, pot or pan to the size of that coil, you will get more even results. Which brings us to the one burner that did have a larger coil and was able to handle larger cookware. All right, so here I have the Breville PolyScience Control Freak. It is a whopping $1,500. It was the best model we tested. Are we saying everyone should buy this? Definitely not but it really does perform incredibly well. Its front control knob allowed us to dial in a super precise temperature, but the display screen also shows the corresponding temperatures like low, medium, high that you're more familiar with on the stovetop. The precision on this thing truly is out of this world, as is the power. It has a nine inch coil compared to the six inch coils that was more typical in the other induction burners we tested. With a larger coil, this allows you to use larger cookware. It'll cook in a larger section of the pot. This was the only burner to boil water faster than a stovetop. It boiled four quarts in 20 minutes. The cost of this burner means it is definitely not for everyone, but it truly is an amazing piece of equipment. Best for experienced cooks that really want the benefits of that precision cooking. Ultimately, our Best Buy the Ducks Top is a great option for most people. So to recap, which burner is right for you? Electric, inexpensive, really portable, really small, can't really do every type of cookware because it's kind of small and not that powerful, but really a great option if you just need an extra burner for some basic cooking tasks. Gas, much more powerful, great for wok cooking or any kind of searing, high powered things. Great for outdoor cooking and great in power outages because you do not need electricity. Um, you do want to use it in ventilated spaces if you bring it indoors, but otherwise you are free to use any kind of cookware on this. And finally, induction. Very cool technology, also requires electricity, a little more expensive. So this is sort of a step up from electric. It's more powerful, more efficient, but it's not compatible with all pans. Most pans will work, you know, just stick that magnet on the bottom to see if they will, but something to keep in mind. So for more information on all the gear we talked about today, check out the links below or go to americastestkitchen.com. What kind of burner would you go with? Gas, electric, or induction? Let us know in the comments. Make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode.